Okay. Okay, looks good. Can you help me get people in? Okay. Yeah. Her the cat. <laughs> I'll run up the other end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring the flag. Oh. I might need help driving. Like when I flip between bits, yeah. presentation videos. I'm here. So, uh, just one logistic. Well, the so there is a uh, machine middle box there, a IoT device. <laughs> so if you haven't badged in to the sensor things, so just use your badge, touch it, it will automatically uh, badge you in. Senses you. Yeah, so basically it's a... Uh, it's a sensor. <laughs> yeah, it's a sensor, basically. Yeah. So it's how OGC... Uh, what should I say? Take attendance. Yes, please. Take attendance, yes. It's very important. So, sir, are you giving your free sensors to everybody? No, they're expensive. <laughs> no, they're only ten dollars. <laughs> but it's just a shield. Uh. And I literally, I drove to Montana, pick them up. With yeah. 300 radiation shield in my van. Yeah. And How'd that go in customs? <laughs> yeah, it's really custom. And then, the, yeah, the to pay the tax and come back. Because they don't ship to Canada. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good presentation. Sir. Okay. So. Let's start this session, and we have three speakers, and then they are from industrial industry, three industrial talks, and very exciting topics. So the first one is uh, about logistics and rail. The second one, uh, the, the rest of two are about connectivity, okay, so and security as well. So uh, the first one, I would like to welcome uh, Corey Banks. He's the director of uh, Can Do Rail Services. It's, uh, she's from Calgary, and they have a big vision to disrupt logistics and in the rail industry and using IoT and sensor things. Yay. Uh, so let's welcome Corey. Thank you, Corey. So you all have to be kind. I'm probably one of the least technical people in the room. Um, I know enough to be dangerous is what I call it. So um, I'm a 23 year supply chain professional. I've been in the rail and logistics trucking industry for a very long time. I've done a, managed a lot of different supply chains. And um, about three years ago, um, I wrote a paper for the Canadian Supply Chain Sector Council on digital supply chains and what the value of collecting better data in the field would mean to the industry. And from there, I started two years ago working at Candy Rail Services, where we recognize that we've got some challenges in the rail industry about figuring out where our rail cars are. And through that journey and evolution, um, I was very, very fortunate, and then I think very wise, um, to partner with the Sensor Up team to help us build the platform that we're building um, as far as uh, trying to create um, supply chain optimization for rail. So I need to uh, talk a little bit about who can do is, what we do in the industry, just to kind of give you some context about some of the internal and external change challenges that I deal with on a regular basis. So 
Can Do Rail Services um, started about 41 years ago um, pulling up rail ties in a rail abandonment um, in, the, in the rail industry. Since 2012, we've actually grown um, close to 70%. I would say we went from $40 million in 2012 to $135 million. We went from 14 different locations to currently 35. This year alone, we have actually grown by 140 people. So we went from 600 uh, or so people in uh, the beginning of January of 2019, we're now at 803. So we're growing. Can Do is considered an innovator in the rail industry. And from an operational perspective, that's something for us to be really, really proud of. We handle 95% of the potash in Saskatchewan. Um, and we are huge innovators in the rail space as far as first and last mile operations. So one of the things that was really exciting for me is I got to come inside this really heavy duty operating frontline industrial company and start talking about digital transformation and how do we actually move the industry forward. To give you an idea of the kinds of companies that can do deals with, this is our customer list. So when you look at who we're talking to and who we're doing business with on a regular basis, these are the people that we actually provide boots on the ground rail services for. We're now beginning to provide boots on the ground um, digitization services for them and helping them understand their supply chain better. So a little bit about the rail industry today. It is a 140 year old industry, 138 actually, but uh, I'll round it up. It uh, doesn't have real time data. I'm going to show you guys a little video in a minute that sh showcases Bob and Claire. And um, I didn't realize until a couple of weeks ago that Bob is actually somebody at can do that gets fired all the time. So whenever we're getting examples of HR do's and don'ts and stuff, they always fire Bob. And I didn't realize that. And then when you see the video, you understand, I was like, okay, this is pretty funny. So industry, we have these things called an AEI reader, automatic equipment identifier. It is a 1960s RFID is basically what it is. It's built along all the rail tracks in North America and it does not collect data. Um, unless you pass it. So in the rail industry, you pass the AI reader, you know where your cars are, as long as the barcode's working on the rail car, and as long as you're going fast enough, because if you're not going fast enough, you don't trigger the inductive loop, and you don't actually get the data on where the rail car is. The industry runs off of that kind of data right now in North America, which means that we have a whole bunch of black holes in our network. We have a whole bunch of spots where we don't actually know where things are, primarily at the origin and destination. And if you remember the story I told you about can do, that's where we're really strong is at the origin and the destination. So um, the other thing about the AI readers is they're railway owned. So the railway controls the data that the shippers and the consumers of rail services get. And the shippers don't have any control over that information and that's really important. It means that we're missing data. It means that we have huge gaps in the timeliness of the data. Um, as an example, one of our recent challenges was trying to use the AI reader data going into a yard um, and we got the data a day late. So the rail cars arrived and a day later we got the information. So it's not timely and it's quite often has to be corrected or fixed. Um, and what that does in the rail industry is it sets up a lot of fighting. Um, you'll hear stories in Canada about the grain industry and everyone's all mad about the grains not going to the ports and all that kind of stuff. And you hear things about Bill C-49 at the um, Transport Canada level and the federal level about data and being able to get the data. And what I've realized is that it's not a shipper and a railway problem. This is actually a technology problem because one of the railways is actually participating in the platform that we're building and they have the exact same problems that the shippers have. So that means to me that all this fighting and all the back and forth and all of the finger pointing as I call it is 100% a technology problem that can be solved by having better data. So you know you understand the rail industry today and you've got a little bit of context about why this is such a big change but in a perfect world we would, we would be using IoT data that's timely end to end, it's configurable, it's unlimited and it's fast and easy. 
And one of the partnerships that we have with Sensor Up actually enables us to do that because we're using OGC standards and we're using sensor things. And so that actually enables us, it creates the platform and the base for us to be able to actually then take the data and do something with it. So for me, in a perfect world, we have OGC standards that create the foundation for us to actually leverage and build off of. So I'm gonna pause here before I get into Quasar. I have a little video to show you guys. So if I can successfully exit. Oh, Steve's gonna help me. Thank you. So I'm just gonna show you our Paul marketing and Claire are rail transportation managers at competing grain companies in Winnipeg, and they both need to transport grain to Vancouver. Bob uses AEI readers to monitor his rail cars. Most of the time, he doesn't know exactly where his rail cars are. He has high dwell times and is regularly charged to merge fees. Claire always uses state-of-the-art, secure, cloud-based GPS technology by Quasar to monitor her rail cars anytime from any device. She always knows where her rail cars are, has low dwell times, and is seldomly charged to merge fees. Bob spends three days organizing his shipment and relies on rail yard staff to physically locate his rail cars. Claire spends just three hours organizing her shipment using Quasar's online representation of her rail yard. She easily locates her rail cars and quickly creates her switch plan. Claire also has time to check historical cycle time reports for the route to identify potential network bottlenecks, and she makes note of frequent delays in Edmonton. Bob and Claire's shipments leave the rail yard at the same time. Claire uses Quasar to check her rail cars are en route. She also checks the real-time network health tool to monitor potential delays and notices there are still delays in Edmonton. So she diverts her rail cars through Regina. She notifies the Vancouver rail yard of the delay to realign unloading resources. Bob is left in the dark. He has no idea his rail cars are heading toward a major network bottleneck. Claire monitors her rail cars as they seamlessly travel via Regina and sets up a geofence alert to notify her when her rail cars reach the Vancouver rail yard. Bob notices his rail cars may be stuck as he hasn't received a location update since his rail cars went past AEI readers east of Edmonton several hours ago. But as he doesn't know his rail car's exact location, all he can do is wait. Claire receives an alert when her rail cars arrive at the Vancouver rail yard and rail yard staff immediately unload her grain and move the rail cars into storage. Claire uses the yard management tool to coordinate her rail cars return to avoid dwell times and demerge fees at the rail yard. Bob's customers call him to find out why their grain hasn't arrived. Thanks to Quasar, Claire has saved time and money. Her customers are happy and her rail cars are on their next journey. Don't be left in the dark like Bob. Let Quasar help you track, visualize, and optimize your supply chain. The future of supply chain management is here. Are you ready? Thanks, Steve. Thank you. So we're trying to solve a pretty big problem. And um, we're a little bit cheeky at can do sometimes. Um, for those of you who are physicists, if I screw this up, you can tell me later. Um, but uh, we picked the name Quasar because a quasar is a black hole with a beam of light quite often shooting through it. So it's a little bit cheeky, right? We have black holes in the network because of the AI readers. And so we picked a name called Quasar um, because it brings light to the situation. So um, one of the things that's most motivating for me um, about what we're trying to do is um, when we're building our digital supply chain strategy, there's really some fundamental things that we need in order to be able to optimize um, transportation. And one of the intrinsic value things for me about supply chain, especially in Canada, is we're a country of natural resources and we ship almost everything we've got out of here to someone else, whether it's to the US, to overseas, to China, Japan, whoever. And so Canada, actually really needs a high productioning, high functioning supply chain. And the rail industry and the rail network is probably the best thing to do to move our bulk goods out of the country. Um, in order to do that, and in order to actually increase 
shipping natural resources for Canada increases our GDP, right? So we want to know what's going on so that we can see if we can actually move stuff faster. If we can get more stuff out at a lower cost, that's really good for Canada. So one of the things that intrinsically motivates me about what we're doing, and even though I face significant resistance from an industry perspective on a daily basis, um, this is something that we need to do as a nation um, to move us forward. So when I'm looking at supply chain, one of the things Jeff and I were talking about at lunch was that supply chain is all about distance, all about volume, and all about um, velocity. Sounds kind of familiar, right, for, for all of you guys? And so there's actually the economics and supply chain are very, very tied to um, time and space. And so when you're looking at the financials of how you're operating, getting the real time data of what's really happening on the ground and so that we're not finger pointing, but we also know what's really happening so we can actually improve it is really, really important. And then creating a digital twin. So that's actually what we've done at Can Do. I had one of my team look at me and go, we made a digital twin and I went, I, don't, I swear a lot. I almost said a bad word. Um, <laughs> I was, I said, oh my goodness, that's not what I said, but that's what I'll say here. Um, oh my goodness, we did. We created a digital twin of what's going on in the rail industry for our customers. But layered on that, we have to actually have some financial information. We need to know what the activities that we're doing in supply chain cost us. And so I don't use the words blockchain deliberately, um, but we are working towards allocating cost to goods movement, um, which is a blockchain-esque function, and having approval processes where we're processing and approving um, those financial transactions as part of the platform. And the reason we're doing that is because one of the biggest parts of frustration for me meant trying to manage my supply chain was I have my all my operations data in one thing and all of my accounting data in SAP or somewhere else where I couldn't get it. And then trying to match that together is incredibly painful. And then you get weird answers and then you average out your costs and you don't really know what's going on. So for me, taking all those sort of platform foundational pieces and capturing all that data is really, really important to be able to have the analytics to optimize your supply chain. So the foundation that we have, you can see there's layers to this foundation, right? We have the sensor things, we've got open um, geospatial um, consortium and the, and the platform that you guys have created that we're actually using. We're pulling together all that data to create information for the supply chain and then that actually enables us to move things forward and, and identify opportunities for change. So as part of the Quasar platform, um, we have sensors and I'm going to talk about the fact that not all sensors are created equal as I'm sure you guys know. Um, kicking some around in the rail industry with g-forces greater than you know 14 g in some cases just from regular motion um, was a bit of a challenge. We had to get some of the sensors changed. Getting them to stay on rail cars that was a pretty big challenge for us too. But when you think about a digital twin there's the origin which is the yard usually the mine or the port or wherever. There's the in-between, which is what's going on on the rail network, and then there's the final destination at the customer. So our yard management and shipment visibility um, applications actually give us that end-to-end -end visibility of where is everything. Where's my stuff? That's like the first thing that most supply chain people want to know is where's my stuff. The second thing is how much, what status is it in and how much did it cost me? So when you look at the platform, We've taken the, the data from the sensors, we're pushing it um, uh, through sensor things and then pr presenting it to customers um, actually using Google and giving them an interface, a mapping interface. Um, we have our activity-based costing module and then we have Quasar Explorer that's actually um, in development for us by sensor up, takes all the data and actually lets us do a whole bunch of very powerful analytics and visualizations with the data. And then as Steve talked about, we really want to be able to predict and prescribe solutions within the rail industry. So there is an artificial intelligence component and we're looking at how can we better predict ETAs? How can we um, better predict volume that's going to happen through the Port of Vancouver? And how can we actually position assets throughout our supply chain to make it manage uh, better? So this is one of the sensors that we use. Um, it's a sensor that was developed by a satellite company um, I typically don't tell people which one it is. Um, we we kind of keep that one under, under wraps because we've had it configured so that it works in the rail industry, as I mentioned. 
um, one of the biggest challenges is making them stay on the rail car. When a rail car couples, I don't know if you've ever been around a train, you hear that big boom, and there's it's the coupling between the rail cars, and it is a significant impact. It's such a significant impact that these devices actually thought that they were in an accident and kept saying, I've been hit, I've been hit, and we had to turn it off because the device battery was, was actually declining on us. So, you know, what does better, faster visibility get us? Well, it allows us to actually enable our customers to know what's coming at them and when it's coming at them. It enables us to proactively prevent issues and actually work with our partners to resolve problems that we have. And when you prevent issues or you actually um, solve problems, you actually decrease your cost and you increase um, your ability to get goods to market. So you can increase your velocity. Increasing your velocity, especially in the rail industry, every rail car that does not ship because we don't have the capacity is a lost revenue opportunity. It's also a lost opportunity for Canada because our GDP is tied to the natural resources of this country. We also can increase communication. I sit um, as one of the members of the Commodity Shipper Roundtable um, for Transport Canada and the shippers and the railways. And there's a lot of uh, emotion. There's a lot of emotion at the table about who didn't do what, who didn't, when didn't they do it, why didn't they do it. And as I listen, I realize that they do not have the data. And so the reason why there's a lot of communication challenges and a lot of energy and effort being put into shipper railway communication in Canada is because we don't have the data. We don't have the facts that actually help us move forward. Having all these things enable us, as I said, to reduce cycle time and reduce dwell, and that allows us to ship more stuff at a lower cost. So the platform is based off of the foundation of getting better data. So let's get better data that actually tells us what's going on, and then we build up from there. So that's it for me. I didn't want to spend too much time. Um, does anybody have any questions? for Corey? Yes, like, Jeff. We were talking about it a bit at lunch, but I thought it was kind of interesting. What, what uh, you know, obviously the rail industry's been around, obviously the rail industry's been around for many, many years. You're introducing a very disruptive technology. What are the some, some of the challenges you're having to overcome in sort of introducing new technology into, you know, a very long-standing, this is how I've always done it. Yeah. Yeah. So the first part is actually education. Um, a lot of the, um, I've talked to hundreds of executive level and senior level supply chain uh, professionals now, and um, maybe 10% of them actually understand um, what the Internet of Things actually is. Um, and maybe uh, of that 10%, maybe half of them understand the value that it's going to create for them and their organizations. Um, and they compare us to the old ways of doing things. So some of the challenges that we, we have and some of the changes that we've uh, been doing is we've got pilot groups with a number of uh, some of the key customers that you saw on the list there, um, trying to educate them, trying to take them on what a digital supply chain actually is and how it creates value. and all that kind of stuff, because they compare us to the old AEI technology, which is super cheap. Um, not accurate, but super cheap. And of course, you know, sensors and technology and cloud um, is not quite as cheap because there's a hardware cost that's built in there for rail car. So those are some of the challenges that we uh, try and face or manage every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm just curious uh, what, uh, either on the IoT side or even for the, the all of the underlying um, logistics and, and base map information, which OGC standards are you currently using or are there standards you'd like to see developed for that way? So That's a Steve question. <laughs> they use the sensor of solution. <laughs> sensor things basically. And also for GeoJSA. And then uh, in the future, so our roadmap is uh, we'll try to use others, for example, if it's feature, the feature if it's a 
maybe vector tiles in the future for visualization. Yeah. So, but mainly sensor things because this is geospatial sensing. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Any other questions? And it's quite impressive to see uh, Corey. They, it's a sorry, rail industry is ancient, and then but they are very innovative. And then so I think actually it, it's a very good uh, use case for us. I mean, they, it's a community because they have a lot of opportunity in this old industry, and they are really waiting to have visibility. And then so I I, I think I should share with you is like you know once. I was blind, but now I can see. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and that's really what we, this community can bring to them. Okay, if not, thank you very much Thanks, for it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, And the next speaker is uh, Roman from Tectelic. Tectelic is ass kicking um, Laura company, and they make, they have very strong uh, technology um, uh, background and they make carrier grade LoRaWAN. And so today, actually, I think it's a great idea for the community to know what's LoRaWAN, and then actually uh, Roman brings, kind of brings out his sensors, and then, uh, and as well as the gateway, and I, I think I'll let you to talk about it. Um, where you are? Here. Cool. How to make from here? I have to, to press it here, or no? How do I go? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, this one as well. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Stephen. So, uh, yeah, I'm from Tectelic. Uh, Tectelic is a uh, we are a ten year old company. We came all out of Nortel. Uh, used to be, I guess, Nortel. We became Ericsson. We left uh, about 2009, just over ten years ago. We were doing a lot of initially building radios, uh, like carrier grade radios. We do for Ericsson, Nokia. Paris Communications, a lot of defense contractor applications, so building products that will really be you know, used in, in military, not really for active combat, but for, for military applications. Um, but then about five years ago, we started looking at the um, IoT applications. So we are a wireless company. We always did wireless you know, communication gear, I would say. Uh, but predominantly was initially based on kind of a larger scale networks, and I was started looking at the, at the LoRa. And the reason we did LoRa because, oh, I should push it up. And the reason we did actual LoRa because we were looking for a good IoT uh, network, maybe architecture. Um, and we looked obviously at a number of uh, networks and you can see it right there. Um, and we, we ended up at LoRa for multiple reasons probably, but the simplest one was uh, it's, using, it's using unlicensed frequency band and, and probably the most important one is actually standardized, right? So, it really kind of follows, it's an open standard comparing to Ingenue and uh, maybe the Sigfox is a proprietary, this is proprietary, this is proprietary. Um, Ingenue kind of a, in a way was, maybe we'll call it proprietary, trying to become a uh, standard. LoRa was really wide open at that time. It is owned by one of the companies, US companies, uh, Suntech, similar to Qualcomm, uh, but it is really based on the standard. They only own the actual IP for the, for the silicon itself, for the devices. Um, just to get an idea that that was number one, number two, it uses unlicensed frequencies. So typically uses means ISM frequency band in North America and Europe. In North America, we have 20, I guess, 22 megahertz of it. In Europe, they only have about five or six and it's really spread. Um, so it's a 915 megahertz in North America, it's 868 in, in Europe. And then China, Asia, other places, there are around 920 megahertz. There's a box, approximately six, different frequency bands globally. Um, but in North America, we have the most actually, the frequency band. It's important to realize that LoRa is not good for everything, right? So LoRa is really good if you want to have kind of a stance for like low range, low power, low, uh, so I guess low power, long range. That's really the idea. So it gets you very large distances. And, and I think 15 kilometers is not really kind of a very large. We, in Canada, I think our record is 105 kilometers in Quebec. Um, but that's not even the largest, you know, the, the people actually in Europe, they always, you know, they always break a record. I think last one was 700 kilometers, but that's really from the plane to the, from the plane pointing up, right? So it's not really practical. But we're typically going to get in the rural community, like rural, like rural places, if we have a lot of deployments in, in Quebec and, and all of it is actually in Europe. It's about 15, sorry, in US. 
and it's what about 15 to 20 kilometers quite reliably. You can go up to 40 kilometers. I'll show you some use cases in Nova Scotia uh, on the um, fishing farms or, or lobster farms. It's in excess of 40 kilometers over the ocean, the ocean but that's typically, you look at that. Um, and then just want to compare, I don't want to look at everything, but just to give an idea, you know, when you look at it, like LTEM and NBIOT, which we also we do, I want to make sure you guys understand, we don't just do LoRa, we do, we do standard cellular technology to this day, we have a lot of customers, and we also do LoRa. Um, but this one really uses the cellular license frequency band, so that's really, you have to be dealing with a large operators, you have no, you have no option to deploy it actually anywhere else. And then there's a Sigfox. I think the biggest competitor would be Tulora today would be a Sigfox, also uh, uh, standard developed in, in France, in, uh, but, but it's a, it uses the same frequency, approximately the same data, we'll call it data throughputs uh, on the down, actually there's a mistake here, but the, it should be only 100, but uh, anyways, on the downlink, but it really um, doesn't have, oh, sorry, on the uplink, but doesn't really have anything on the downlink. Um, but about the same range, we'll call tel, 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 10 kilometers, give or take. Um, the, um, the beauty about LoRa, the last one, is it's a very low power consumption and it's a very low cost. And we'll talk about the cost devices as well. Here, when you look at the LDEM, now from all the standards that you are showing here, the most common ones are today, obviously, LoRa. This is already gone. I believe uh, NG New Company is filed out. They don't exist anymore, I think. Uh, this is probably the most common in the world. Uh, LTEM and NBIOT are just becoming available right now. LTEM is really North American standard, NBIOT is worldwide. This was actually driven by uh, North American companies or maybe European companies. This was driven by Huawei. Um, the difference is really this one has a very, well, this one has a very high data rate. It's almost a handset. This one has a much lower data rate, very similar to maybe to LoRa. But the problem is they consume much more power and they, they're still much more expensive. Um, Sigfox would be similar, Symphony and uh, White. In Korea and, uh, and, uh, and in Taiwan, there's some thing when people talk today about IoT technology. We don't we don't list generally like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, those things because they're not really IoT, truly IoT technology. Um, the, by the definition, actually, that devices have to be connected all the time, have IP address, things like that, and protected. So, just at a very high level, I don't want to go into details because I want to maybe spend a little bit of time giving an idea what things cost, things like that, and how you do it. But our architecture of LoRa is incredibly, incredibly simple. Um, so I'm used to you know 2G, 3G, 4G technologies, you know, cities like CDMA, UMTS, LTE, and and it takes you 10 years to to understand the standard, like five, 10 years, and you still don't know it. Um, when when we were actually introduced to Laura, somebody sent us this document and said, well, that's a standard that I took at home. It was kind of like, it was Friday, just reading at night, so I read the standard, you know, and maybe have a glass of wine, and I said, okay, well, I kind of understand that, so I went Monday, I called Samtac, and I said, okay, I read this one, I understand, can you send me more documents? And they said, that's it, that's, you have, that's the standard, and I, I was kind of shocked, because, you know, then I started realizing, okay, I have to read the second time to understand everything what they do, but it's really, really simple. Um, it consists of really the sensors, which we call devices, and they're all kind of devices. The devices literally today we built already $15 devices that do five your battery life, I'll show you. So just to give an idea, I'll speak. Maybe the most expensive and least expensive devices. Okay. Let's see. It's a little bit easier, like the like this. Yeah. So this is just to show you what it is. <clears throat> I won't be carrying the gateway, so. So the devices can be anything like simple, like as a, a home sensor. So we'll call them smart home sensors. They have about 10 different functions. You can actually see what they do. They do everything from you know, picking up the, the who is in the room, the temperature, humidity, moisture, light, uh, dry contact. So you can put on the door, you can detect when somebody you know, moves, open the door, things like that. It's probably today the highest volume. Uh, and the company who's buying it actually it's Ericsson. They don't even support LoRa, but they're deploying them everywhere in their offices globally. And they want to know every cubicle, if the person is or not, how often it's used, all the meeting rooms, how many people in the meeting room. And the logic is very simple. They want to optimize the real estate. They want to drive the real estate down because it's the second most expensive asset after obviously people. So they have generally these devices, depending how many functions you do, they'll do five-year battery life on this, on this, this form factor. 
not exceeding 50 packets per day transmission. That's the, that's the key. It's how many packets you send per day. It's a 50 packets per day transmission. That's about, you know, will be three to five year battery life. But that's probably the cheapest. It's about, you know, you know $30 today, going down to $20 in the, in the volume, things like that. And we sell them like 50,000 already, things like that. Um, then another one that probably people are kind of more interested in it would be like just agricultural sensor. They do a lot of, you know, you can put them in the ground, you can measure, measure moisture of the, and the moisture of the soil and the temperature, but you also put them actually measure also light and the moisture, uh, sorry, I guess humidity and, and temperature of the air as well. Um, it's really designed not for the ground because although city of Calgary is going to use them to just maybe monitor golf courses and green belt, things like that, but that's not really the main application. The main application is trees or vineyards. The same design, you remove these two, it has to be a design that where you don't have these steel, we'll call it probes, you mount it on a tree, you have actually, you have a, a connector that drops the sensor in the ground and you can very accurately monitor vineyards temperature, I guess temperature of the air, light, humidity, as well as the soil moisture and the temperature of the soil. Because people who develop, I guess, people who work in a, in a wine industry, they need to know, they need to anticipate the temperature, what temperature they're going to have that day, and know they need to water or not the vine, you know, the, their um, vineyards. And they almost do every five meters to be so precise because the quality of the grape depends how much water you have every single day, depending on the temperature, humidity, everything else. So it's a very, very unique. So that's a typically the application. The other application for this one is somewhere in Africa uh, for the apricot trees, because in Africa, lots of light, lots of land, but it's very expensive uh, water. So they want to put pretty much on every two trees, one device. So like just to give you an idea of what kind of devices we have, right? And it's, you know, and then there's applications where people deploy these things now in a forest to understand people measuring the, which I didn't know, they, they drop it actually in a forest in the ground to understand how moist is the soil to understand if potentially it's a risk to have a fire or not, things like that. How much? Uh, this, this one is about $100, $100 to $120 about would be in the volume quantity. And it has about guaranteed five year battery life and it's IP67, so minus 42 plus plus 65 degrees Celsius. Obviously when it's winter time, you don't have to keep it on, we turn it off. It just goes to sleep and then wakes up the next spring. You can program it and keeps on going. Okay. Um, this is really simple. I don't want to waste too much time. It's just a smart switch, you know, a lot of smart switch. You can put this now, you know, in your house outlets and there's actually a switch and there's an outlet, just like a Z-Wave. This is just LoRa based technology. So you can, and just to give you an idea from a single, from a single gateway, which, are, which is right there, typically would be like a small Wi-Fi access point. I don't want to go. You can cover easily five, five to, to, well, city of Calgary, like department downtown, they cover about 10 story building with a one gateway for $250, something like that in that range. 250 to $300 gateway will cover the entire, it's a, it's a, they actually right across from the Vogue building downtown. So it's a, 40 meters by 35 meter building, old building, 10 or 12 story building. They put one gateway in the middle, they cover the entire building. They can move anywhere, these sensors, and they just they detect them. I'll show you how it works as well. And any of these sensors for that matter. Now, the trick is, it's very important to realize that the gateway has long range, we'll talk about it. Uh, the devices, these devices will cover about 500 meters, the small ones, you know, like these ones. But the larger devices, they, like, like these ones or, the, the, or, the, or this one, um, like the agricultural one, they'll do, you know, they'll do, we have cases right now, 10 kilometers about give or take, right? But they have a little bit more kind of a, there's no really any trees too many, there's no buildings. So you get the obviously much better RF channel. This one here is just to give, and I'll done go with this one. And that's a good idea. This is actually a device. This is a, a really a, an asset tracker, maybe similar to, to so, uh, we, we, we don't, so we build products only on spec. So we generally, we have customers who say, you want you to build me a product, this application. So this is designed to uh, be mounted on a vehicles, containers, maybe not so much trains, although we do have a Deutsche Bahn right now is testing them. So in Germany, very large company to know exactly what their assets are. So it has a GPS, it has a accelerometers, everything else to detect it. Uh, I think it's designed to withstand like 25 G shocks and then uh, IP67, the key is it also has a Bluetooth. So it's effectively, when, you, when you're attached to something, 
outside. You can detect, obviously, you have the GPS, so it will be position is coordinates and it will use a lot of network to you know, send the data. If there's no lot of coverage, we'll just collect the data and then we transmit it. If it gets into any kind of a closed environment, we'll call it a you know, garage or something like that, it will switch off to the Bluetooth and actually can use the, uh, yeah, the Bluetooth data. It will position itself and it will send the data as well. Um, and then about $150 or so, it's a 10 year battery life. It's actually has the most, we have two to three batteries here and it's guaranteed 10 years battery life on these things. So they're tested quite heavily. That's probably the most, I find it, maybe I think you mentioned about the shock and those things, but the customers we deal with, they absolutely cannot afford it to deploy these things once a year. It has to be deployed once for 10 years, and that's what they really pay money yeah. for. Yeah, yeah so that, yes. So what's this uh, upload frequency, the packets a day? Uh, how often? Honestly, I don't know. This one hack can go for, this one can go like literally every 10 minutes. It, this one has no limitation on power because there have, we have so many different use cases. For, but the thing is like this, it's when you're traveling and you have, you upload the data, you might need it quite often, but then you stop. When you stop, you're not moving. You don't need to upload anything for quite a while. So it depends on the use case. And we found that the worst use cases for these things are, let's say, it would be a delivery truck in the city, like a, a, like a UPS or, or FedEx, those things, they drive all the time, right? But I think the trains are actually not that bad. But the UPS, those guys, they, they never stop, literally. Or that, you know, maybe taxi drivers, but not the guys who actually who, who sit at the airport. And this one is actually unique, very unique. It's actually, a, it's a, um, so I want to just, and I won't go to the devices. This one is a, a it's an e-ink device that integrates with your Outlook, Outlook or Google. And you put this thing anywhere you want. So um, I'll take this one off. Let's say it's a brand new, we just actually released it. And you put it on the door and you can imagine, let's say university or school or even offices, like in, you know, companies have many, many offices. So you book the meeting room, you wanna make sure that meeting room, if, if the meeting room is booked, it's going to say that meeting is occupied. It actually has no wire, it has LoRa. You can it faces to LoRa. It has four AA batteries and will guarantee about 10 months battery life today. But we're trying to optimize it to a year. You can also use a power over ethernet to power it and then you'll get blue, you'll get light uh, pointing out if the room is occupied and this corner is actually bright white. If it's not occupied, then it's, uh, or maybe the other way around. If when it's available, it kind of, a, it, it actually glows white, very bright white color, telling you the room is available so you can grab it. Um, and then when the room is occupied from far away, then it goes dark so you can't really see, you know, the room is actually being occupied. But it's, not, it's nothing more than just uh, e-ink. It supports four languages, so including Japanese, because it's just a driver. And so if you book the meeting, and then in fact, you have a, we have a calendar that book the meeting rooms, it will display if the meeting room is booked or not, um, who booked the meeting room, um, and then until what time. It also indicates right away what the meeting room has. So it has TV projector, all that information, so people know if the meeting room is booked, but nobody is in the meeting room, you can actually push the button, you can finish it, you can cancel it. The system can cancel it for you. It's like a, it's like a very fancy meeting room, you know, we'll call it the display. But you can put in the meeting room, you can put in the auditoriums, you can put at schools, you can put actually, uh, we're starting to test it at the doctor's office where, you know, you go to see a, you go to see a doctor and physician wants to tell that, you know, they say, go, go in that room, doctor will come to see you. It'll be nice to know that you're coming and there's actually a display for you to come. Or like university, people know which, which class they should be in, things like that. But it's fully interactive. It's a full interactive and works through the wire, well, so through the LoRa system, through the same gateway. And you can put it anywhere you want, like on a window, on a door, anywhere else. You can put it at home, so you can imagine. Um, it, it, we work a little bit closer right now with the Deutsche Bahn, I guess German company. They want to put a smaller variant of this on every on every seat inside the train. So when you when you when you book the, the ticket, when you go inside the train, it will say that that's your seat. That will say you know whatever Stephen Roman whatever it is. Welcome Steve. Welcome Steve. Whatever you want to say, and maybe in your own language even. Um, so that, that's the next thing. They are deploying right now the gateways on the train. Now the, the new thing is I want to maybe mention this. We'll talk about maybe yes. So, so that's the devices, and there are literally hundreds of devices. I think um, I forget the name. Corey. Corey mentioned. I, I will definitely second that. There are many devices in the market, especially 
like not many gateways because gateway is more complicated to build, but many devices. But out of a hundred device, out of ten devices, you can probably, if you're trying to build something high quality, you can throw away seven right away. Like seventy percent of them are just not worth. They're good for testing, but not really to deploy. And then there's a thirty percent you have to figure out are they good enough? What's working? What's not working? And I have to say, like we have today about eight devices that we finished. Uh, and probably seven devices we never finish, we never will finish them. We just cancel them because we know we can make it work. We cannot make it work reliable enough, and it's, it just doesn't make sense to throw good money after bad after some period of time. So it, some of them are very difficult to do, we make to work reliably because you want to get good reliability and, uh, and obviously low cost. So what does a lot of network consist of? So those are the devices, so I don't have to go through it, and then we'll go through the gateway. So it consists of devices, all kind of devices, of sensors. The range can be anywhere from 500 meters in a, you know, let's say a kilometer around this building to many tens of kilometers. That is a gateway, so really base stations. The devices block the gateways, that's really it. And then the gateways actually communicate through the 3G, 4G, potentially sometimes cellular backhauls, in, in the oceans, we use cellular backhauls on, on the trains. If actually a train is pulling, you know, 100 carts, and you don't have a lot of coverage, we put the gateway on the train, and then the train creates its own bubble coverage, and then just pulls it, and then sends everything around it. And then it goes to the network server, which is really a software application. And then we, start, well, it's a, it's a network server. It's a software, we'll call it, maybe it's an application, but it's a service like a control for it, and there's multiple different, you know, uh, servers there. There's geolocation server, ONM server, things like that. And these are the application, then the data goes to, and then, you, you know, you get the devices. You get, you get the data, whatever you expected from the devices. Generally, the idea is the devices are kind of are paired with the applications, right? So you get, you know, this is the network element in the middle. These are the devices, those are the applications. Very, very simple compared to the, compared to the 3G, 4G, 5G technologies. The key thing is obviously what's Laura cannot do everything I said before. Laura can do very well, long range, very low power consumption, very low cost, but not high data rate, right? So that's the thing. If you ever want to get to, you know, in megabits or even hundreds of kilobits of data throughput, you can really use that Laura for. Plus, Laura will always have a delay. So if you need something instantaneous, something happened, and you have to make the decision right away. Laura will have maybe a second or two delay. Now you can do edge computing. So in most of our cases, the action is taking place right away because the sensor will do that. But then the information has to maybe try to take a second or two to get to the network. And the idea here, as you can see, it is we have these spreading factors. So when the when the spreading fact, it kind of shows the closer you are to the to the tower, then you can use lower spreading factors, similar to CDMA technology. So it means you're not really spreading the data. You can put all the data in a much, you know, uh, send it with a much higher SNR, we'll call it. And that means you can, you can get a lot higher data rate. But then the further away you, you have to, if you have to spread the data, that means you're spending a lot more time on air because you're spreading the data. At this particular, it's almost, we're talking about now, uh, I think it should be about approximately 400 milliseconds on a, on a, on a spreading factor 12. So you, you're spending a lot of time transmitting it. So you can get a very long distances, but but not a lot of data sent back and forth. So the idea here is it just got a kind of a, you know, the closer you are, you're going to get more data, the further away you are, you're going to get less data and you're going to use more battery. Um, the key features, so I already kind of discussed it, so I don't want to go too much into it, but very long range, it has very good in deep indoor penetration. The most common application today are metering, water metering, gas metering, there's approximately almost 60 or 70 million water meters sold yearly right now that support LoRa. It's by far the biggest application. I think last year they said there was 110, 120 million devices sold globally, and out of them half were, were water meters. And then gas metering, and then obviously some other devices. Um, it start topologies, so it means you have nodes and you have a base station talking to you. In Canada, we recorded 105 kilometer range, but that's, I wouldn't want to tell you that's a practical, that's just something you see from here up there and it's direct line of sight and things like that. But if you do, let's say we, we are discussing right now, one of the use cases here, we're talking about monitoring wildfires all over Alberta, all over BC, right? So for us, it's becoming very important. How far can't you get? Because it is going to be line of sight, right? It's going to be towers or something 
on mountains or something, you're going to have line of sight to the top of the tree. So you don't want to you don't want to be building a network that has a coverage of 10 kilometers or 20. You want to build a network that has coverage of 50 kilometers plus. So that's the idea. So so it is important to 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 have it. But I would say practically speaking, in a city, we're looking at Calgary downtown. It's Calgary downtown. We have three towers, and we have a pretty much all of city downtown covered. So it's a maybe two to three kilometers very reliable coverage, but not in building. In building, you want to put the indoor gateway because it's much economical. Battery life, I, 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 I'm, you know, so it's a 1,000 milliamp hours. It's a five-year battery life. We, we, we literally guarantee to customers. So that's kind of to give an idea. Um, so it's very good. Um, and, the, and in many cases, you can actually run them out of solar and power. So if you put the gateway in the top, somewhere in the forest or maybe in the, in the mountains, the gateway will typically consume average. Like the, the bigger one you see there, probably about 15 watts average. The small one, six watts or seven watts. So you can run them out of the solar panels uh, all year round, maybe even in Alberta. Uh, capacity is almost hard to explain, just to give an idea. Like that we, we never seen yet, you cannot really exceed the capacity, just the airline capacity, but because it's approximately the, the large gateway, uh, no, I don't have the largest one here, but the one that's kind of a, the square one, the, the, the long one, it, it will do about 5 million transmissions, receive 5 million transmissions in 24 hours. And, and there are different spreading factors. So we can really, practically speaking, exceed the capacity because at some point you just don't, don't have enough sensors to put in. You need to, you need to more area, you need to put another gateway for that. So it's very good. And the reason is it's very simple because it's such a low data rate. Each packet probably would be, you know, Average transmission throughput we see is approximately 10 kilo, kilobits per second. And then the beauty is really the most important of all of it is, um, so it supports obviously public and private network. For people maybe that don't know, public network is uh, TELUS or somebody develops a network and everybody can connect to it. Today we don't have many, although we have, they're very large customers, but most, most of our deployments are private networks. would be a network like um, a railway company here. They deploy the network, their own, they rely on it. Well, maybe, I'm not sure what you're using, but there are lots of companies that build their own private networks. There are some public networks in the US, there's some public networks in Europe. The largest one probably would be Orange in France today. There's a KPN in Europe, uh, but there's a lot of, lot of private networks. Okay. And it uses unlicensed spectrum, and that's probably the cheapest thing to, to understand, the lowest cost. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I think it's, you know, in addition to the low functionality, it has a very good geolocation. We can locate the sensors without the GPS very, very accurately. And that's probably what it offers there because we can, we can do a time difference of arrival. So if you have, as long as we have three or four gateways, maybe let's say four gateways, maybe even the more of the battery it is, and we have a device, when the device sends a packet, multiple gateways will receive the packet and then we can triangulate and get it very accurately. In a city, in a city core, we'll put them down to Maybe within 50 meters in an open air, we can get down to 25 meters very reliably. Um, in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, I forgot the uh, Golden Gate Bridge inside the park, we're probably down to 25 meters almost all the time right now. So it's pretty, no GPS, right? Very good. Um, global standard, and I think has unique ideas. So I'll just skip through that. This is all kind of the product that Tectalic has, our company. We, we almost have zero customers in Canada, it's kind of unique. Until two years ago, we had absolutely zero customers in Canada. We only had international, but now we have a few customers in Canada. We have on the East Coast, we have in Cal, we have in Alberta here. We are starting to do a little bit of work with oil and gas companies, but not much yet. We do quite a bit in the US with oil and gas companies. Now we have customers that buy our equipment and deploy in Russia and Siberia a lot today, but, but hasn't really somehow come here, maybe because we're so focused elsewhere. But factly, these are our sensors and we built all kinds of other sensors that are, if we see there's a value, we'll build it. These are our gateway. We have more gateways than any other competitor globally. Actually, we have more gateways than top three competitors combined and then comparing to us. So Cisco, Curlink, and Multitech, if you combine those three, we have more gateways than three of them have. Um, but devices we just starting to right now. And then all these are network servers. So there's network server, geolocation, how you configure the gateways, devices, and then ONM server. And the reason we can do it quickly because we leverage a lot of developments from LTE and 3G, 4G technologies in the past. These are now the use cases. So I just wanna, and I don't wanna spend through it, but I mean, 
some of the most common ones are tracking. I think as was discussed, it's a very big use case. I would say today in the industry, the biggest ones are metering, number one, because there's so many deployments. Number two is asset tracking. Asset tracking in building, outside the building, you name it. So it's a very big, I don't wanna, you guys have a presentation, I don't wanna spend too much time on this one. Uh, smart city is number two, okay. I would just simply say like this, smart city, everybody is talking a lot, but nobody's really doing much yet because um, because it's kind of a, smart city involves a lot of government. And I think anytime you involve a lot of government, it's just, you kind of, it's just so many policies. You just cannot do anything. Um, in, in my experience, so we just, when you talk to smart city, if there's a, somebody you're dealing with and they have an idea, we can, we can have a product in six months. But if you involve real, real government people, like we had, city of Calgary had the network now for two years. They won a national award. They were the smartest IoT city. They have like, what we gave them, but they want like 10 or 20 or 30 million dollars and they don't know what to do with it. So that's the problem. Uh, but there's a lot of excitement around smart cities. Uh, building management, that is real. This is where absolutely lots of money being, lots of money being saved today. Ericsson is deploying 120,000 sensors between this year and next year. Every single office they own, they have sensors everywhere to, to measure, literally knowing how many people in the room, how often in the room, and then knowing do we need to have this building or not, how do we realize that? It's everywhere, and it's not just, Knowing people is also lights and everything else. That's why we have smart lights. So it's there's just enormous amount of smart applications. And because buildings generally owned by private people, they care. They know exactly how much money you spend. So like you know, we rent we rent a building uh, from uh, our uh, real estate. We see exactly what they're spending money on. You have a history of 25, 30, 40 years where your money go when you run the building. You can save it very easily because you don't have to ask permission anybody. And then smart agriculture, it's starting. There's lots of applications, but maybe hasn't really you know, progressed that much. And this is the new one that we're doing right now. It's actually doing early fire, fire detection because the difference between fire, if you can detect the fire within 12 hours, you can pretty much put any fire out with very little effort. If, you, if it takes you 30 hours to detect the fire, it's either out of control, you cannot do anything, or it's going to die on itself pretty much. So um, the use case in Calgary, everybody knows the Devonian Garden, anybody who is in Calgary, all those sensors, that, that's what the city of Calgary deployed, they're monitoring everything, you know, soil moisture, temperature, everything in the Devonian Garden, one little gateway. Literally, it's like a $150 gateway covers the entire, the entire garden. So they spend something like maybe $50,000, I'm not sure how many, but thousands of dollars on the devices or sensors and $250 on the gateway, the cheapest gateway you can buy. So just to give you an idea, so it's all in sensors. And this is a use case in Nova Scotia, a brand new one. Um, you know, some were actually, some, there's an island, maybe it's not Nova Scotia, maybe it's actually belongs to Quebec, but it's close to Nova Scotia. It's the biggest, it's the biggest uh, lobster farm, I would say, but it's something like that, fishing farm. And they put the gateway in the middle of this here, and then they put this voice in the middle, and then they are monitoring temperature and a few other things at the bottom and then at the, at the surface. And it's guaranteed for them, I think, 10 year batch of life as well. So they, they're really important for them. Very short, one minute presentation. So very, very short, just to give you use case, how uh, movies. Which one is Maybe. Maybe the asset tracking first. So which one is okay. And while you're watching the movie, I'll just tell you. So it's a very self-explanatory movie. It's, a, it's, it's little devices like this, how you can track anything inside the house, office, anything. So if you use LoRa and Bluetooth, you can see you put the Bluetooth normal beacons for $20, and then you attach little tiny devices. This is the size of a double A battery on any asset. And then, and then you put the LoRa gateway. And the idea is we use, we use Bluetooth to locate and then LoRa to send the data out. So you have, we have an asset, we have a projector, you mount the device at the top, and it can be anything really, it can be whatever you want. See the projector is sitting here right now in the office, person is going to take it, wrap it, just move it across from, and it just goes from there to here, to one of these offices. You will drop it, you have to put it in the table, and there's, there's just little $20, the blue one is $20 beacon, and you'll see it just jumps right across. 
So you know the paths have moved from one place to another place. And it's and it's those sensors will probably last about five to ten years as well, depends how often you move them. So where it's really used, hospitals. Typical hospital have a 30 to 50,000 assets and they need to know where they are and they can't really use anything else. And that, that's why it's so useful. But you can obviously use other places as well. And then this is a very unique one. It's a company in Canada. And I would actually encourage you, if you ever guys want to use it, it's a company called Extelia. It's probably the smallest, well, the small company, but very good. They developed this. It's a LoRa based, it's all LoRa solar powered bus display. It displays when the next bus is coming. So people can actually come to a bus shelter and see when the next bus is coming. And it's actually, it's solar powered, has the little GPS, and you can see it will just up, look, a lot of network to update. The next bus are coming. This is the time, the next bus is, is this bus coming so many minutes? This bus coming so many minutes. So you can deploy and even display information to people because it's very little information, but it's very unique. So in, 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 and the reason they do that because it's a law in Quebec right now, uh, that maybe four or five years ago, I don't know, they told me, there were young people obviously uh, had a little bit to drink and then they went to after bar and it was really cold and they were trying to wait for the bus and they just fell asleep in a bus shelter. And it was like minus 40 degrees and they froze to death. So now they're trying to make sure people can actually know that the bus is not going to come, or that was the last bus or something like that. But it, I'm not sure if it's really the reason, but that's what they're doing it. So they're deploying it. They also have lots of other things where they have signs today in Quebec where if they're going to, if they're going to clean the road from snow, the sign will tell you it's going to clean today the road so you cannot park the vehicle on the street. Thank you very much. The, the units are there if you want to have a look. Thank you, Roman. Uh, very impressive presentation. Maybe have one question. Sure. Okay, yeah. Emmanuel. By the way, I have all the stuff here leaving. I might even leave it for, um, I don't really need this. And then I'll, somebody will bring it. So if you guys want to see it, kind of all the brochures are there. Please feel, feel comfortable to, to take any brochure or anything. Like that. Don't take the devices, but you can take the brochures. Okay. One question. Yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, do all your sensors support uh, STA? And the same, same things. Oh, oh so for me. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually, through University of City of Calgary, actually, we have uh, the sensors from Quebec and then come to the same things. So the Devonian Garden, for example, we have a work with City of Calgary using the Quebec solution, communication, as well as the connectivity, as well as the sensor, and two sensor things into a dashboard. And yeah, and also we have a tracking, golf cart tracking solution as well. Uh, with City of Calgary using their gateway. Yeah. And the connectivity to connect to their solutions like that. I, I didn't get to it in my presentation, but I also have several examples of using Laura. Okay, the next speaker is Jim from Expedo Wireless. And they actually the first time I met uh, Jim and your team, I was very impressed by what they are they're offering. And they actually we are going after a similar kind of client. And I think I was impressed. So that's why I invite Jim here and to share with you. Lots of synergies there. Right? Oh, you have a great vision. Yeah, let you drive. I'll probably screw it up. <clears throat> Oops. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Thank you, uh, Roman and, uh, and Corey. Uh, those are, uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, some of the, the meetings that we've had here today. So first, thanks a lot for Steve and all right, the group for inviting us to speak. As Steve says, uh, Expedo has some interesting disruptive technology that really ties in nicely with IoT and spatial. So we'll hopefully get around to that. I think I have about 15 minutes. No, it's okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. just well. All right. Um, <clears throat> But uh, we'll just go through a quick intro and then kind of here's some of the items I'm going to walk through. I will touch a bit at the end about who Expedo Wireless is, but I'm hoping to use this as an education, uh, much like Corey was saying. Anytime you have a disruptive technology, half the challenge is getting the messaging across and you kind of hit it on the head. People have a perception of how things are done. And, you know, there's a lot of people who don't even know you can do this. In fact, we had Vodafone engineers in our office in San Francisco and they they didn't even know that they, they could do it. So. Anyways, myself, I'm uh, a Calgarian. I'm an engineer. I uh, 
was actually interested in geomatics in my first year of engineering. I was doing a tour of uh, the different faculties you could specialize in, and geomatics was really cool. They said that they, geomatics used more computation power than any other discipline in engineering and even more than the computer science group. And I, I ended up going into electrical engineering. And Steve, I wish you, I could have had you as a prof, but you were probably in junior high at that time. So <laughs> <laughs> I do like technology. Um, uh, I, I follow it a bit. I'm not that much of a gadget guy, although I don't have, like Ed, I don't have stuff in my house. I don't have a nest. I know how to turn my thermostat. I do have a programmable thermostat, but I don't need to you know, clap on and clap off my lights. I can figure that out. <laughs> um, I did start uh, in firmware and hardware and moved through software and worked for in the large integration software companies and have uh, now recently fell back into the wireless communications world. Now I'm married with kids. I live in Calgary, we're close to the mountains, so if you're not from here, hope you have a chance to uh, explore it all, get out to Lake Louise and the whole area, it's quite beautiful. And I do like beer and wine too, might as well throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so quick like just trends and opportunities that uh, we see that I've actually experienced. So I've been with Expedo for two years, just to be clear. Um, so it was a new introduction in space for me and it kind of turned my brain back on for a while because I was doing a lot of IT consulting and integration work. Pays the bills, but it's kind of nice to get energized about stuff. So, as you know, huge demand for things. Huge, huge amount of demand to connect these things, to gather data, which drives insight and analytics and automation. So that's a lot of the stuff. Remote monitoring and automation is huge. I live and work in Calgary. Our beachhead is oil and gas and industrial and mining. Um, leads to a lot of safety and automation. And even leads to efficient operations. And if you spin it the long term, you know, an environment to the impact. Because right now in the oil patch, they're, they're rolling trucks. Operators are rolling trucks, looking at all remote uh, batteries and oil fields. But if you can remotely monitor, um, you don't have to go and drive that truck out there. So that's a safety issue, but it's also uh, a green issue. So a lot of oil companies are actually layering technology because there's such an environmental um, microscope on the energy industry. And this is ways they can help uh, go that way. Um, Industries are seriously using looking at LTE, right? There's a lot of different technologies, uh, as Roman uh, talked about, and I'll, I'll touch on some of them later on. But LTE is an interesting technology that is now kind of bridging the gap away from the carriers. The carriers hold on to it so much, and LTE is and private LTE is becoming a reality. Um, with that, the carriers are scrambling to deliver LTE to the enterprise. Um, they do it in a certain way right now, but it's really not the way the enterprise companies would li like to consume their services. But again, it's uh, like any large company that has a monopoly in an industry driven by sales, they're selling what's on the truck, so to speak, and that's the term that we use. So the sales reps will continue selling what they have, even though the enterprise customers may not want it, but the customers don't have much choice and private LTE and technology that Expedo has now gives the enterprise companies that choice. So 5G. Everyone's talking about 5G. It's a great way to get budget if you're an innovation, if you work anywhere in digital innovation in your company and you throw out 5G, you'll get budget. Um, truth is it's a bit of ways away, um, but I'll talk a bit about that. Um, other thing that's making the reality of LTE as an alternative for communications uh, or not or attractive communication other than Wi-Fi or LoRa is the fact that the chipset costs are coming down. Like Wi-Fi has been around forever. A chipset and a Wi-Fi modem is, is super cheap. And the big makers of the like Qualcomm's and Sierra Wirelesses and, and Telex, uh, those chipset prices are coming down. There's a lot of manufacturers are starting to build modems and gateways and uh, things that will run networks. So private LTE is gaining mom momentum. And what will happen is, it's, I, I now, my analogy there is like LTE right now is what Wi-Fi was 15 or 20 years ago. People didn't know about it, didn't know how it worked. Roman's correct, it is complicated. Um, but it'll bring that down for the common enterprise network architect and companies like Expedo and others are making it more IT like and make it more like Wi-Fi. And it is uh, from a technology and the physics point of view, it is a, a better technology than Wi-Fi for certain use cases. I'm not going to throw the other ones under the bus. I'm not an RF engineer, um, but uh, it is a better technology for certain use cases. So some of these opportunities. And since we're at the geospatial, uh, you know, how does it impact you guys? Well, connected workers, connected workers, tracking workers, giving a worker, I said about my laptop, I have an LTE enabled laptop. So now that field worker can be connected, right? 
and that field worker can have information of where he is. So if he's at a, if he has a tablet with an application, has geospatial information, he could be at a water meter, he could be at an oil field site doing meter readings or something like this, and it already knows where he is. He doesn't have to start looking it up. If he's at a remote location and you have that geo information, it could already pop up the screen and he can already have all that contextual information of where he is. Um, Wi-Fi replacement, that's really doesn't have so much of a spatial impact. That's uh, more of a, just a use case for LTE. But disaster management is pretty huge, obviously. Um, in a disaster, that happened in Nova Scotia uh, this week, right? Hurricane hits, cell towers are down. How can I give people communication? So people were out of power, people were out of communications. But with satellite technology and uh, LTE technology and private LTE, at least for the first responders, you can give them connectivity like that. And as well, depending on the different technologies you use, you could extend that technology out to the consumers as well. So disaster management, Department of Homeland Security, situational awareness, um, LTE technology is a perfect marriage for that type of technology. Um, remote monitoring and automation, touched on that earlier. I think that's fairly obvious. Smart cities, industrial safety, asset tracking, um, we touched on. Autonomous vehicles, a big thing coming on. People in Alberta, at least, autonomous vehicles, things of autonomous haul trucks and autonomous dozers in the mining industry. But it's not just a huge industrial stuff. We're working with a company that makes floor cleaners and autonomous floor cleaners. So these are gonna be driving around the Walmarts and the Costco's uh, off hours, cleaning the floors, but they're autonomous. So they need secure connectivity, reliable connectivity. We'll touch a bit on digital transformation. There's a lot of buzzwords out there on digital transformation. You've probably seen it. Um, if, you're, if you're obviously you're in a technology related field, um, fourth industrial revolution and the digital oil field. And some of these things, again, are very oil and gas related, but they're disruptive, they're cloud. These are all the things that you want to do. And a lot of larger, well, we run into a large of oil and gas companies and others that have digital portfolios now in their, in their, in their, you know, their C-suite or digital transformation groups or innovation groups, right? So what, you know, that's becoming a thing as, as Corey mentioned, you know, things have to change. So a classic example is someone like an oil, a big oil gas, oil company example in, in Alberta, you know, the whole exploration is down or because of the, um, the lack of pipelines, they can't actually ship any more oil. They, I mean, they can keep producing it, but there's really, the pipelines are full until new pipelines are built. So the only way they're gonna make money is lower, getting some more free cash flow. How do you do that? You operate more efficiently. So to do that, you need some digital transformation. A lot of that has to do with, a, it's a foundational technology. There's three, sorry, three pillars to the digital transformation. I stole this from Jeff Kahn, who's uh, an industry guru, if you've heard of him, and he calls it the digital trinity. And uh, so data. That's where a lot of you, you folks are involved, IoT data, spatial data. I can't say there's a shortage of data because there will be an explosion of these things and more and more data will be created. Um, on the other end, you need the compute, right? So you need big compute of analytics and AI, machine learning, robotic process automation. Um, a lot of it is being pushed out the edge, but you still need to at least gather the data Com compute it into a big compute like Google and Amazon. Once you can create the model, you can push it down to the edge. But some of the edge devices, you still rely on that. So how do you, the one, the, the other part of that digital trinity, the third leg of the stool is connectivity. So you've got to connect this stuff. I've been to a lot of industry stuff from you know IoT and oil and gas. And Microsoft has a local thing in Calgary in February. That's a really good thing about um, Microsoft technology and digital and how to be digital. And everyone glosses over the connecting of the stuff. And, and there's different technologies to connect the things to the compute. And that's where Expedo and, and LTE can come in and how it can have a big play into it. So we always say, well, so what? Well, we've seen the quotes, billions and billions of devices. I, I don't even know where I got this quote. I probably should have put the quote in there for reference. But I did make that up. I copied it from something. But there is, it's going to be 25 billion or it's going to be 10 billion. Anyways, it's with a B. There's a lot of them. Right. So with that, you do need to have a digital transformation strategy. Um, and if you are an enter enterprise company or if you're a city or municipality um, or an industry, if you don't have a digital strategy, you will be left in the dust and competitors will, uh, will take over. So connectivity challenges, um, we go talking to process automation people or um, networking communications companies. 
there's a lot of challenges. There's security is always a big thing, right? So there is connectivity out there, but how secure is it, right? Is it on a public internet? Is it on a carrier network? People do have an inherent trust of the carriers. Oh, I trust AT&T, I trust TELUS. But at the end of the day, that packet data is still going into their servers and into their data centers and into their core network switches. And our disruptive, our disruptive technology is that it actually doesn't. Um, cost is always a factor. Um, I think uh, Roman hit on it big time. Uh, LoRaWAN does have a huge cost. Any low power type of technology is typically lower cost. When you're using unlicensed spectrum, it's a lower cost, um, but cost is always a factor of how you do it. A remote last mile is always an issue. You know, you're sitting around Banff or Calgary or Toronto, you've got connectivity everywhere. I mean, I didn't realize actually downtown Calgary had, not only has cell coverage, it has LoRaWAN coverage. I'm not sure if that's out to the public or a private network, but you know, coverage is always an issue. And this it gets into the stuff that some of the big, big enterprise companies care about is the control. Who controls that network? Who controls my device? Who controls what the network is called and how many networks defined? Who controls where the path of the data goes? How flexible is that network? How, how, how flexible is it for me to rapidly spin up a network because I have a project to do and I have a six month POC and I need to spin up a project or I have a longer term project, but it's not part of the core business quite yet. And I need a dev test, pre-prod and prod network. Right? I want to create all these networks, right? Um, in LTE, that's typically difficult. To, you know, if you have a Wi-Fi network, it's easy. Um, speed and agility, how fast can it take? The carriers have a concept of uh, private LTE. It's called a, an APN. If people understand that net technology. It's a basically kind of a private network for the enterprise. But it takes, like, in some cases, 10 to 8 weeks, 8 to 10 weeks to stand up. We were working with one company in Mexico, seven months. Seven months to create a, a, a private network for them. And we can do it in seven minutes. Um, transparency is also an issue. Transparency with this goes back to the carrier model. So we, you get your bill. We all get cell phone bills. Do you actually check it? Did you really get, did you count your minutes? Because no one's tracking the minutes on your cell phone, right? Um, you don't get what's called the CDRs, the call detail records. We just get our bill. And unless something, unless you're checking it or some anom an anomaly, you really don't know what you're getting. So the transparency of, of, of on the billing side, and then the choices, choices of what carrier I want to use, what technology I want to use. Um, and then there's the issue of the worldwide jurisdiction. So certain types of technologies um, are locked into a carrier model, in which case if you're a multinational like Shell or Chevron and you operate in 100 countries, you probably have to deal with 200 carriers. So every one of those carriers have a different solution. Um, so if you have a way to kind of crush that and, and slice right through it, um, and you can have one worldwide solution, that would probably be more advantageous. So these are some of the connectivity challenges that you'll run across. Uh, Expedo happens to uh, nail on a few of those. Some connectivity options. Um, Roman touched on a few of these. So at the top of the heap is satellite. I'm guessing the most expensive you use it, right? It's the most expensive. <laughs> it's the most expensive, but you know what? Hey, it works. <laughs> Anywhere in the world, top of the mountain, may not work in, a, in the bottom of a mine shaft, mind you, but just about everywhere else, satellite works. The next typically is cellular. There's lots of cellular coverage out in the world, obviously in the remote areas. On the outback of Australia or northern Alberta, it's not as good, but there are ways to stand up private cell networks. And then there's a low power WAN and there's point to multi point, there's Wi Fi, Zigbee, there's a bunch of others that I haven't even labeled up there. Um, but you may have seen some of these as you connect your IoT devices to them. So I'm going to talk really quick like on LTE 101. It's a few slides. Um, like I say, I really didn't even understand because I've, I've owned a cell phone for a very long time, like many of us. I didn't know how it worked. It just works. We take technology for granted. I'm an electrical engineer. I made modems back in the day, but those were like wireline 1200 baud modems. <laughs> if anyone even remembers what that is. Um, so what is LTE? First of all, it's, a lot of people don't even know what it is. It depends on who you're talking to. A lot of people in the technology space get it, but it's long-term evolution. It's just the evolution of the standard. So there's one, two, three. Roland can probably give us a lecture on it more than I can, um, but 4G and LTE just stands for long-term evolution. Um, it is a, just a protocol standard. It's a wireless protocol standard. It's mature, it's evolving. It's been going on for 30 years. It's built for mobility. That's another key thing. It's actually built for mobility, and it's a pretty 
if you look at the history of it, it's pretty ingenious what they've built and how it works and how it makes use of frequency channels and it's connecting to all the towers and it moves around and everything. When you get to a fixed wireless thing, meaning a, a fixed sensor in the ground, it still works, but it is really built for mobility, which is great. And in the, in the spatial world and IoT, some of the stuff you're building, you know, like I say, tracking assets and buses or, you know, disaster services, I mean, it just works. Um, large device support. There are some other emerging technologies out there, but there is large device support from major manufacturers, obviously. Um, we see it in our cell phones everywhere, uh, but it's lots of sensor technologies are also doing it as well. Um, and everything has its place, so just to be very clear. So we don't think this is going to, Expedo and the people don't think LTE is going to solve the world's problems um, because everything has its place. It, a lot of it will be a hybrid mesh network. And I draw diagrams just much like Romans where you'll have a Wi-Fi or a LoRa network out in the edge because it can reach out far. But then you bring it back to an LTE kind of gateway and you use LTE to bring it back. And with the cost of these radio chipsets coming down, LTE radios are being slowly dropped into the actual sensors themselves. In fact, I think one of those LoRa sensors, they have an LTE version of that as well. If, but again, probably costs more than the LoRa one. I'll let uh, Roma discuss that one. One other thing about 4G, once they got to 4G, it became a full TCP IP network. So all of a sudden now, um, it becomes very familiar to the enterprise network architects at a lot of large companies or just modern technology. You're not working with custom protocols. You're just working with TCP IP based networks. So if someone can land an IP packet onto your network, that's it. Their job is done. They 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 gateway onto your network and let's let your network group define it. What VLAN it's on, what it routes to, can it get to the internet, can it get to my SCADA network? Let you know it it really does make it IT and OT friendly. So we kind of expect to demystifies the telco bits and brings it down to IT related things. Um, fewer, I guess, I guess in the, the one, a couple of points there that I should point out is on the, the uh, comparison to Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of people have Wi-Fi everywhere, um, but the power of Wi-Fi, because you're using licensed spectrum, it can go further. And Wi-Fi only goes for, I think, like two or 300 meters, if that. But with LTE, you can go for like 20 kilometers and, and you have different size of the radios, um, but it gives you a better handoff and it's a, it's a better wireless uh, communication protocol. But much like uh, LoRa, the, there's really three main components to an LTE network. You have your, your user equipment or your devices, right? So that's represented on the far left with the SIM. Then you have your radio access network or the RAN and the technical term is evolved, universal terrestrial radio access. No one says that, they just say the RAN. <laughs> but if you ever see that. And then you have what's called the core network switch, the evolved packet core network switch. And there's a couple of different components inside that. And then typically, when you think of an LTE network, you're thinking of the LTE network that you get with your phone or your laptop, it's gatewaying up to the internet, right? So at the end of the day, the, the, the brains and the core smarts of the network are in the EPC core, because that is providing the network routing and switching. And if you think about Wi-Fi, this isn't really much different than a Wi-Fi at a high level. You have your devices, you have an access point, and you have a network controller. One thing about LTE is it is inherently secure. So what it has, at the radio link layer, it is secured. And then the, the control plane of the signaling, and there's a, it's, it's secure. And at the data plane layer, there's bi-directional communication and encryption. So out of the gates, LTE, from a security level, it already gets typically the checkbox from the chief security officer compared to some of the other wireless technologies out there, right? But then what's private LTE? So I'm gonna layer that on with LTE, because right now you can use LTE and you can go buy uh, a data plan from Bell and Rogers and slap it into a sensor and off you go. But again, there's some downfalls to that if you're an enterprise company or if you're trying to control your network or trying to get what's called quality of service if you're trying to actually um, affect the radio access network. So what is the art of the possible here? So what are the art of the possible is if, if you could take everything you have and kind of basically put it in behind your firewall and put it on your network and secure it and control it. And then there's this concept of private LTE network and public LTE network. What if you, what if you're in Calgary and you didn't have to stand up your own radio network, but use Telus's and Rogers, but then you're up at Fort Mac or at a remote mine site. And I can just, I, if there's no carrier coverage out there and they're not going to extend it, you can stand up your own. So the ability to have your own private network and utilize someone else's radio network infrastructure, but still have the data come to you behind your firewall and then make it look like Wi-Fi. Make it work and look like Wi-Fi, like I say, kind of demystify all the bits and make it easy for you to use. 
So that's kind of where private networking is going. And I kind of classified it to kind of three types of networking. Um, there's the full public and consumer side, which is just you and me and our plans. Then there's kind of two kind of private networking. There's private networking over the carrier networks. But that, what I mean by that is that's where you're using the infrastructure of AT&T and Rogers and Vodafone, but you actually have your own network tunneled over top of that as a virtualized network. And then there's true private network where you have your own private radio network. You have your own spectrum and you've leased that spectrum from Vodafone or, or from Rogers or from Shaw and you stand that up in your mine or up at your mine site or at your, your end of the head of your pipeline. So it's a, the full spectrum of full control of my radio network and my devices down to I'm just going to roll over top and, 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 and use the infrastructure of the, of the, uh, of the carriers. But what's the difference is it comes down to some of the things shown on the bottom. So the SIM management, how do I manage my SIMs? Like what, what can it connect to, what can't? And the network management, what I mean by that is, how can I create my virtual networks, right? How do I, in the world of Wi-Fi, you create your SIDs, right? You might go into your office and you have one or two different Wi-Fi networks, you might have a guest network, right? Those are just virtual networks that ride on top of that and we can do the same thing over LTE. Now the radio networks in the spectrum. So the radio networks out here, basically have a, a quality of service. So when you, when you and I connect to it, the quality of service is just set to low. And by default, when it connects, it gets the lowest quality of service. So technically, it's called a QCI. And when you start using your phone, it might crank it up a bit to make sure that you can actually make a call and watch that video. But when you're not using your phone, it drops off. It still stays connected because your, your IP address doesn't change. It, it still holds onto that IP address. And then it still stays connected, but it doesn't actually use that channel so much except for kind of a heartbeat. Um, and then when you start using it again, it cranks it back up. So this, this depends on the criticality of the use case. If you're doing autonomous haul trucks, and when that haul truck network at the, at the mine stops and it's millions, millions of dollars an hour, you want criticality high. So then you have a higher quality of service. Whereas if I'm just have a temperature sensor and it's sending, you know, 100, 200 bytes of data three times a day, not so critical. So the use cases make a difference. But the definition of private LTE is such that you may have able to control or affect that control. When I say control, if you own your own radio network, you can certainly control it because the radios that run the networks are called E B radios and you can actually control the, that. Those are made by Nokia and Ericsson and Huawei. And there's a lot of what are called small cell radio manufacturers, which you could have it up here, but it's much like a Wi-Fi access point. It doesn't really look much bigger, but it's actually a cell radio. And so if you run that on inside your network or your warehouse, um, the other thing is the carriers are starting to get into this game of enterprise LTE and some of the carriers we're working with are starting to define it that given the right use cases, they will actually, given the right profile, they'll actually change the, that default from low to say, say you're a, a railway company and you actually sign a contract with a, a carrier and you will pay for a certain quality of service. They will give you preferential treatment on their network, right? They will actually raise that because they're willing, they realize the enterprise companies will pay for it. Because goodness sakes, when some network router out in the sticks breaks down, they get a helicopter and fly it out there for $10,000 to replace a $200 router. So they'll pay for network connectivity. The other aspects of it are security and control and some of the integration levels. So for sure, guaranteed, if you have a, you have a, want to get a private network from a carrier, and you want it to hook into your Active Directory, your DNS, or you want it to send information into your sensor data when something attaches, for example, you want notification when a device attaches, you don't have an API to get into one of the carrier's network cores. But if you had that at your own core, you could actually give that data. So now you not only do you have a connectivity data from the ILT side, but you have a management network. I can, I can tell when that thing's actually connected or not connected. You know, or how good the signal strength is. Like, depends on you know how far deep into the network you get. And we're working with companies that are doing that, and they have actually written firmware for Cisco access points that when that thing connects, it actually is broadcasting back to their network monitor what the quality of the radio signal is, so they can actually see their hot spots and the low spots in their actual networks. So talk a bit about Expedo. Any questions on LTE? <laughs> So Expedal, first of all, it's, it's interesting because when we start explaining it, you know, we are not a hardware manufacturer because you start talking to people about networks and this and that, they, they, they automatically assume we're putting towers up or we're, we're, we're a service company that uh, has certified guys that can climb towers and install networks or we make radio manufacturing equipment or access points like 
uh, tech tablet. But you know, we're software. We we make actually the L e EPC. We make the Evolve Packet Core Switch, and we uh, ride and we dockerize, containerize. I'll get to that. But it's basically it's providing private private networking over LTE mobile and mobility networks. So, but at the at the end of it, it's really just an extension to your IT LAN. So it's you don't have to reach out beyond that because right now a lot of the enterprises. They run and controls their LAN and their WANs and their Wi-Fi's and that's in their IT and their OT and their SCADA networks. They control all those themselves. But the minute they drop it out into that LTE world, it's the abyss and they, they kind of don't have control because the way things have always been done is that that's what the carriers have always sold them. Um, but what we do is we enable them to bring that in-house and, 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 and bring LTE into the realm of their regular IT world. So it's a four or five year old company. It's founded by ex-telcos. Two of the founders uh, live on Vancouver Island, one's in San Fran, and we kind of got mostly people splattered around the west side of North America. There's about 15 employees. Um, we've got stuff spinning in Australia, Canada, um, and US. But what, what do we do? So these, th this, this thing on the left is called the EPC core. I think of Ericsson and Huawei and Nokia. So when Rogers and AT&T and TELUS put up a cell phone network, they are putting, they are building these evolved packet cores to, to run millions of consumers. I, I keep running down to pick this up as my cell phone, but it's actually a notepad. My cell phone's back there. I was gonna use that as a demonstration, but uh, so yeah, they run millions of consumers on these things. So they're big and they're monolithic and they're multi-tenant and they control it all, right? What we've done is we've dockerized and containerized it and, and brought it down to the enterprise. So we're solely serving the enterprise. So we don't we don't have any any hope no sorry any aspirations I should say to take out the telcos we don't do voice we're only data it's all about IoT right but what what that allows us to do is dockerize containerizes and then it allows us to distribute these different components anywhere you want so now I can have one sitting in my data center one sitting in Azure one maybe in Amazon I might have operations in Europe I can stick it over there I have an offshore oil rig I can stick it there. I have a train system. I can stick it in a rail yard and put it there. Uh, but the, you can synchronize all the authentication and the device management. So my SIM, wherever it goes, is on that network, right? So what's Expedo's private take on private LTE? Kind of much, which I like I talked about before. It's your devices. It's your SIMs. Um, you get to manage it. You get to control it. Um, you get to control aspects of the quality of service. And the other nice inter interesting thing that we do is we have what's called multiple profiles. So I, the, all these SIMs on the left are, are bullets, but they're also to show that you can have multiple profiles on the SIM versus a carrier who just gives you a single SIM, right? If I have a Bell phone, I have a Bell phone, a Bell SIM, it doesn't, it connects to other carriers, but it roams over them. We can actually, have, we can connect to all these different carriers directly. But what that means is that we take away you having to try to connect to the carriers yourselves. We actually kind of, bring that into the house. We let you, we do all the connections to the back end telcos and we do it that way. So kind of a deployment architecture for, you know, crayon architecture on the bottom left is if you're roaming over what's called the carrier network or the mobile network operator, the MNOs, your SIMs can hit any public tower and they'll find their way back to your corporate network. And the top left is more of a remote network. It's a mine site. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a work camp at the end of a pipeline. And you can stand, that's where you need spectrum. And you can, there's different types of spectrum. Um, in the US, they have enterprise grade spectrum. In Canada, you, we're working with carriers to get spectrum. So we have a few differentiators, uh, not much. To, I'll just jump to them almost out of time here. So final thoughts, uh, what it means to you, secure and private are a foundational technology to enabling digital transformation. Um, a lot of the companies have not gone to this full model. Like we've had connectivity for 20 years with cell networks. But if you talk to oil and gas, they, have, they don't trust it quite yet. They haven't enabled it onto their networks as yet. Um, but it is true enablement of IoT. So one thing is it's plumbing. It's not that sexy, <laughs> right? It's not a cool technology really at the end of the day. Some of the stuff you guys do, and you know, I love coming to these types of conferences because there's a lot of interesting technology and applications that the people have built that really look cool, like some of the stuff on the, uh, of the stuff that I think it was Jim was, uh, was talking about earlier. And IoT and geospace could certainly take advantage of LTE and LTE private networks. I think it's really, it's a marriage made in heaven because when you want to run your own networks, you want to light up your stuff and you're dealing with customers who have private data and don't want it out there in the free world, in the free world, on the internet. It's freaking, it could be anywhere really. That's it, that's all I got.
Any questions? Oh, you can clap. Right. <laughs> I, have to get, I have to get my step. I, I have to get my steps in. Uh, thank you, James. And then security is critical for IoT. So, and then in Excel, it's a very interesting take on security. And then I think this uh, today's session we have uh, you know from logistics, from LoRaWAN, and to LTE. It's a uh, I think it's uh, really important for us to understand more about connectivity and locations. So, time for one question. But Jim is around, right? I'm around. I'm, at, I'm from Calgary, but I am staying for, uh, for the okay. evening stuff as well. So, I'll be kicking around. I'll, I'll probably have a beer or a glass of wine in my hand. Yeah, so <laughs> feel free to talk to Jim and some interesting work that I've been doing. Yeah, and don't so. be Bob, right? Don't be Bob. That's, what I, that's what I learned about you. Don't be Bob. And so, well, late, however, let's have a 10 minutes break, okay, and we'll come back for the last session, and we have two, again, very important topics, one is AI, so QC will talk about you know, AI and IoT, and then Marcus will talk about security, yep, and then we have a panel, the pa panelists are three interesting guys, very engaging guys, so Ed Parsons from Google, Luis, and Ingo, and then uh, it'll be a very interesting panel, and I'll try to ask, ask some interesting questions, all right, see you there.